thought it would be fun to show you how electricity and magnetism have to be the same force and they cannot be two distinct forces, but I also thought it would be fun to try and do it within 20 minutes. If people have known about electricity for a super long time, you have the electric fish, you have lightning, People used to collect static electricity, like in jars, to do magic tricks. They called themselves electricians, but it's very charming that they saw, even then, the like power of electricity, what it would do. Uh, and then, of course, also with magnetism, people have known about magnetism super long time. You have lodestones that would like collect iron filings. People harness the power of the Earth's magnetic field for navigation with compasses. People have known about these things. And then they started getting the idea that like, maybe these things are related. Let me read you a story. So this is from 1735. A tradesman at Wakefield in Yorkshire, having put up a great number of knives and forks in a large box, and having placed that box in the corner of a large room, there happened a sudden storm of thunder, lightning. The owner emptying the box on the counter where some nails lay, the person who took up the knives that lay on the nails observed that the knives took up the nails. On this, the whole number was tried and they found to do the same and that to such a degree as to take up large nails, packing needles and other iron things of considerable weight. So here we are. They, they know that lightning, an electric thing, has caused a magnetism, a magnetic thing these things must be related. And it wasn't until James Clerk Maxwell in 1865 who published one of the most brilliant works of physics to say electromagnetism. I'm going to take you through an example of why they have to be the same. It's not a proof. It's not a derivation. It's just an example. It's not my example. This example is in like every single elementary physics textbook, but it's going to be fun. Okay. So for this problem, let's consider an infinitely long conducting wire. It's got some velocity of electrons moving to the right at speed V. Velocity V, I guess, since we know the direction. Inside this wire, you have a flow of electrons moving to the right, but you also have a bunch of protons. So the net charge on this guy, which will be the charge density of protons plus the charge density of electrons, is zero because there is an equal number of electrons and protons. If a proton moves a little bit away from the electrons and somehow there's a little bit of positive charge somewhere on this wire, electrons which are moving with the current will also immediately move isotropically to neutralize that charge. So the net charge on this is zero. And I should also mention that this velocity here is on the order of millimeters per second. It's pretty slow, which is interesting. Well, I mean, that's not slow, but when you imagine a circuit and you're like flicking on a light switch, the light immediately comes on, right? You don't expect to have to wait millimeters per second while the electrons move through your ceiling. This was explained to me as like thinking of circuits as like imagine water pipes full of marbles and the marbles are electrons, right? The group velocity of those marbles is some speed millimeters per second. But if you flick a light switch, you essentially like open a gate that allows more marbles to come through. So on the other end of the pipe, just immediately after you open that switch, marbles can pop out because they're all being pushed through. And that's what's happening. It's not that you have these incredibly fast electrons moving at this, well, they are going fast, but the group velocity is not that fast. It's on the order of millimeters per second. Okay, so in addition to our current carrying wire, we are going to have a positive charge Q that is some distance R from the wire, and it will also be moving at the exact same velocity V in the same direction to the right. The question I want to ask is, what is the force on charge Q? What is going to happen to charge Q as a result of being next to this current carrying wire? So now if you would like to solve the problem yourself, pause right here. The answer will be at this time step. See you there, I guess. Okay, they're gone, cool. So we wanna know what is the force on charge Q? And we can have an electric force or a magnetic force, right? So let's start with the electric force going to be equal to the charge times the electric field. Now an electric field requires a net charge 
And as we have said, on this wire, there is no net charge. Every time a proton moves out, an electron immediately goes, gets over there to neutralize the charge. So there is no electric force on charge Q. However, charge Q is moving. And when you're moving through a magnetic field, you feel a force, which we'll call force M, equal to Q times V cross B, where V is the velocity of Q and B is the field that Q is inside of. We're not gonna do calculus today. So I'm just gonna write down the scalar version of this, which is Q times V times B, times the sine of the angle between V and B, which is gonna be 90 degrees, which you will see in a minute, which is just one. So we know V, we know Q, we just have to solve for B. If you've ever taken a physics course, you know right away that B for a wire is mu naught I over two pi r, where r is the distance from the wire to the charge, i is the current in the wire, and mu naught is a constant of nature. It's called the vacuum permeability, con permeability constant. Uh, mu naught is actually related to the speed of light in the vacuum, where c is equal to one over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught, where mu naught is this magnetic constant and epsilon is this electric constant. So interesting, it's almost like they're related to each other. There's a really elegant proof of getting the speed of light of the vacuum using Faraday's law, but it's too much calculus for us to do today. Um, but if you would like to calculate this value of b yourself. It's the biot savart law. It's a nice little integral. Okay, so we now know that the force due to the magnetic field, oh, we're not a vector anymore. Okay, the force due to the magnetic field is going to be equal to q times v times mu naught times i, which we know because our current is going to be equal to our charge density times our velocity, so you have coulombs per meter times meters per second, which gives you a current of coulombs per second. So we can write lambda v over 2 pi r, which we can simplify to q mu naught lambda v squared over 2 pi r. So the magnetic force on our charge of course, depends on the amount of charge. It depends on our magnetic constant. It depends on how fast that charge is moving squared. And also it will decrease the further you get away. So as R goes up, the further you get away from that wire, the magnetic field goes down. That all makes perfect sense. So this is the value of the force. But in order to know what our charge Q is going to do, we need to know the direction of the force. Which way is the magnetic field due to this current carrying wire pushing Q? So we turned our force into a scalar, which means we lost any sense of which way that force is going to move our charge. This is how you do it in undergraduate physics courses before you get to the courses with calculus because all of the information about the direction is contained in that cross product and instead of letting you do the cross product in physics 150 or whatever they force you to memorize these right hand rules which are the worst i just don't like the idea of telling someone to memorize something instead of just explaining what is actually happening and also one time in undergrad, I was taking an exam and I was sitting there like this and my professor was like, Angela. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, are you doing the right hand rule? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, you're right handed. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, put your pencil down. And it was very embarrassing for me. So we have to do two right hand rules, one to get the orientation of the magnetic field and one to get the direction of the force. So first we have to find which way the magnetic field is oriented. And to do that, we are going to point our thumb in the direction of the current. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Angela, but you said the electrons were moving to the right. Why are you pointing your thumb to the left? And you need to blame Ben Franklin for that because Ben Franklin named the positive and negative charges and he decided that current flows in the positive direction. So if the electrons are going this way, by definition, our current is going this way. It's been 270 years of this nonsense, but that's the way it is. With this right-hand rule, you point your thumb in the direction of the current. 
which is to the left in our problem, and your fingers will wrap around in the direction of the field. So if this is our wire, our charge Q is up here, that means where Q is, the magnetic field is going in to the paper, and under the wire, it is coming out of the paper. So now let me introduce you to arrow notation. Okay, so we have this wire, and this is a 2D drawing, and our field is wrapping around it like this, but that's hard to see. So instead, let me draw our little positive charge Q. So instead, people use arrow notation. So an arrow looks like this, right? Imagine an arrow is following our magnetic field. So on the top of the wire, the arrow is going into my iPad or the paper or whatever you're looking at, which means we only see the butt of the arrow. So if you want to write the direction of your magnetic field, you draw that symbol. Like you're only seeing the butt of the arrow, so you're seeing like the little crosshatch of the plastic bits of it. And then that arrow is going to follow the magnetic field and wrap around. You can't see this. It's going to follow that magnetic field and wrap around. So on the other side, you write this, which means it's coming out of the page on that side. That is arrow notation. That is what that means. Okay, so this is how we draw which way the field is oriented on our diagrams. So now we know where the charge is. The magnetic field is pointing into the page. So we can use our second right hand rule to get the direction of the force. So we have our right hand, we are going to point our index finger in the direction of the velocity of our charge Q. And then we are going to take our middle finger and point it in the direction of the field. So that is into the page. And then we're going to take our thumb and whichever way it feels to go naturally is the direction of our force. I hate this. This is so dumb. It's already in the cross product. We should just do the cross product, shouldn't we? This is the right hand rule. <laughs> so that charge Q is going to feel a force pushing up. The magnetic force from the current in the wire is going to push that charge up. <sighs> and you might have spotted a problem. In none of doing this nonsense, did I say that, oh, it's a, a positive charge, so we have to do this, right? And you're thinking, because you're very smart, like, well, that doesn't make sense, because if it was, if we just did the same problem, but with a negative charge, it would have this velocity, the magnetic field is due to the wire, not the charge, it's going into the page, it would feel the same force, that doesn't make any sense. And that's because when you're doing that right-hand rule, you have to remember, if it's a positive charge, the orientation matches where your thumb, is going. But if you have a negative charge, you get this answer and then you go, oh yeah, it's an electron, so it's the opposite. <sighs> I hate it. Or, or you can do the right hand rule with your left hand for electrons. So if that was an electron, the velocity is going this way, the magnetic field's going into the board, <laughs> so the force would push the electron down towards the wire. I hate it. I don't think you should have to memorize things. Like we should just understand why it works, which is why it's in the cross product. The cross product makes perfect sense. This is nonsense. Okay. Okay. So now we know the force that it's going to feel. So if this is T equals zero, where you have your wire and you have your charge at T equals next, you will have your wire force pushing it up, which means that in addition, if this is where it used to be, in addition to its to the left velocity, it's going to be accelerated upward. So it's going to be like over here. It will move away from the wire. That's the important bit. This is what the magnetic force will do to our positive charge in this situation. We did it. Now, I would like to do this exact same problem, but I want to change our reference frame. Let's solve this same problem in the reference frame where the electrons are at rest. What does that look like with our little picture? If the electrons are at rest, our positive charge Q, which was moving at the same velocity to the right as our electrons, is also at rest. So now you have this net flow of protons, positive charges, to the left. So you still have a current, but it's like of protons with some lambda and it's V. Now it's a negative V. Okay. However, 
the same argument we made before about how like there's an equal number of electrons and protons in the wire can still hold, right? So the net charge on this wire is still zero, which means that if we again want to calculate the force on our charge Q, the electric force, which is Q times E, again, the electric field requires a surplus of charge. This is still zero. And our magnetic field, which is Q V cross B, is also going to be zero because Q doesn't have a velocity now. It's not moving. It's not going to feel a force from the magnetic field. And this is a huge problem, actually. And this is actually a problem because changing reference frames cannot break the laws of physics. Changing reference frames by changing your velocity or your position can change how you observe events. But if something is accelerated in one reference frame, it will be accelerated in every other reference frame. If a force is applied in one reference frame, that has to happen in every reference frame. Imagine you're on a busy city street. There's like a bus going 25 miles an hour carrying like 100 people. And on the opposite side, there's a car going 55 miles an hour way too fast for a street where there are pedestrians. This is why you shouldn't let cars be inside cities. And there's like a group of people sitting on a bench just like having lunch. And there's a skateboarder going like two miles an hour on a skateboard. And there's a mom dragging a toddler and pushing a stroller. And they're going like a mile and a half an hour because she's like got She's grabbing him, she's pulling the stroller, it's a whole thing. And then everyone hears the toddler scream. Don't worry, he's fine, he dropped a balloon. He had a balloon, he let it go, it starts rising. Every single person on that city street is in a different reference frame. They all have different velocities. They all see the balloon go up. It physically happened, it has to happen no matter what velocity you're going to. It might look slightly different to this, the asshole speeding down the street in a car, like the skateboarder might see it slightly differently, but they will all see the balloon go up. If the charge moves in one reference frame, it has to move in all the reference frames. A force was applied to it, it has to accelerate. Those are the rules. So there's something wrong with our thinking here. There's something wrong with the way we've solved this problem. Now, if you successfully did the first part, pause here, try to figure out what we did wrong. Here's the answer. <laughs> Thanks for playing. Okay, everyone else, the trick is that we have to use relativity. I know, it's crazy. I told you these electrons are only moving at like millimeters per second, which means the protons in the reference frame where the electrons are at rest are also moving at millimeters per second. And yet we have to use relativity. I thought that was just for fast stuff. No, no. The thing is, is we have to account for length contraction and how that is going to affect the charge density. Because in the frame where the electrons are allowed to move, they will always move to make sure that that wire doesn't have any charge. But if we prevent the electrons from moving, which is what we've done, a little tiny minuscule amount of charge will build up because the electrons can no longer go and like stop it from happening. And we can calculate the value of that w with relativity. So let's do it. So because the electrons are not allowed to move, you get this little bit of charge built up. And so we can calculate the charge density of the protons in the new reference frame, which is going to be the charge density in the old reference frame, which remember was identical for protons and electrons. And we have to account for relativity. So we have this Lorentz factor. I'm gonna approximate this using a Taylor series expansion. So you get lambda, plus lambda v squared over two c squared. So the same thing is gonna happen to the electrons, but in the opposite direction. So the new reference frame charge density of the electrons is gonna be lambda minus lambda v squared over two c squared. So if you want to calculate the total buildup of charge, you need to find lambda proton prime minus lambda electron prime which is math. Let me just write it down. <laughs> it's 
So lambda prime is not zero, like it was in the reference frame where the electrons are moving. We have a net amount of charge, which is equal to lambda times v squared over c squared. And I just want you to notice how tiny this is because c is a huge number and c squared is, is even bigger than C. So our velocity, which is again millimeters per second, is so, so, so tiny compared to C squared. But this tiny amount of charge density is really important to your accounting of the problem. You cannot assume that the charge on this wire is zero anymore. You have to account for it in order to get the exact answer to your problem. So now, when we look at the electric force, which is Q times E, we cannot say that this is zero because if you have a charge, you have an electric field. So now we need to calculate the electric field, uh, which we can do with Gauss's law. So the integral of E dot dA is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is, so remember mu naught was like our magnetic vacuum constant, epsilon naught is like our electric vacuum constant. Okay, so this integral from Gauss's law is gonna give us E times two pi R times L, and that will be equal to the charge enclosed in the wire, which is gonna give us lambda prime times L over epsilon naught. And if we solve for E, we get lambda prime, which is just lambda times V squared over C squared, all times one over two pi R epsilon naught. Okay, now if we plug this back into our force, we get Q times lambda V squared over C squared times one on two pi R E naught but remember that relation, oh, I forgot a parenthesis. But remember that relationship I told you about C, right? So one on C squared equals mu naught epsilon naught. So we can plug that into here and we get that F is equal to Q times V squared times mu naught times lambda over two pi R. And this, oh wow, it turned into a box. That's cool. Huh. This, <laughs> this is the exact same force. We just found that in our reference frame where the electrons are at rest, there is charge. There has to be charge because by definition, we're not letting the electrons mute, move. And that teeny tiny amount of charge over density leads to an electric force that exactly matches the magnetic force that was in the reference frame where we allowed the electrons to move. Two observers must see the exact same thing. And we just found out that one observer sees a completely magnetic effect and one observer sees a completely electric effect. That means the choice between calling something magnetic or electric is completely arbitrary. They, there are two names for the same force. There was one force and it caused Q to accelerate away from the wire in both reference frames. Why would we call one electric and one a magnetism? It's just, it's just by habit. It's just by aesthetic choice. It's not electricity or magnetism. It's electromagnetism. So in our reference frame where the electrons are not moving, if at t equals zero, it looks like this. At t equals next time step, you would just see the charge moving away from the wire because in this frame, it didn't have any velocity, right? So you would, that observer would just see it move away, but it would still move away from the wire. They can see slightly different things, but they can't not see the force. How did I do on time? So that's why you have the Lorentz force equation that combines the magnetic field and the electric fields. Both of those contribute to the force on charged particles. And that also means your choice is, of course, arbitrary. You can move around in reference frames and make something completely electric or completely magnetic or like something in between. I think there's like a great tragedy here. I mean, I don't know if it's a tragedy. I think about Maxwell, one of the greats, you know, top brilliant guy of all time. If you're keeping a list, like people are Marvel superheroes, which is kind of silly. But Maxwell released this amazing theory. Of course, it had the ether. 
the ether in it though. It was there. And we don't have an ether. We don't live in an ether unless you're a YouTube commenter who still thinks we do. And Maxwell died in 1879 at age 48. Very young. Very sad. So sad. Brilliant guy. Took way too soon. What would he have done? And he died right at the time when all of these people that I talked about in my mass video really started figuring out what was going on. Like the Michelson-Morley experiment happened in 1895. And then of course, Einstein has his miracle year in 1905 and he's like, relativity, no ether, reference frames are important. And so I'm so curious what Maxwell would have said. He only would have been 74 in 1905. So that's really, really not that old. He could have definitely made that if it wasn't for the stomach cancer. What would he have said about relativity? It would have been so interesting to see. Einstein has this quote where he's giving a talk at some fancy university. I think it's Cambridge. I don't know. And the person who's introducing the speaker is like Einstein standing on the shoulders of giants like Newton. And then Einstein was like, no, 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 I'm standing on the shoulders of Maxwell. And I just... I wonder what Maxwell would have thought of relativity, and it's a damn shame to lose such a brilliant guy so young. What would have happened? Anyway, electricity and magnetism are the same force. There's just one force, just one. And you, you take the actual ENM course and you learn relativity because you learn relativity in ENM.